Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, we're gonna get started here. Um, I am Bernie O'Rourke and I am the Extension Youth Livestock Specialist here for UW-Madison. And um, I'm just gonna make sure you guys are muting yourselves when you're coming into the room this evening. Uh, there are quite a few online tonight, which is awesome. Um, but we're really going to need to make sure we're tidy with our mute button and if we can make sure those are off. Um, the video cameras are uh, fine if you want to leave them on as long as your bandwidth at home kind of holds on. But uh, feel free, you can shut them off if you desire as well. Okay. Um, so we are so glad to have you all with us on this cold snowy night in Wisconsin uh, to learn a little bit more about your swine project. and. Um, we have a few things just to kind of run through here. Tonight is the second evening of some virtual program we have for you this winter. Uh, so last month we had Roaming the Rumen, and uh, this month we're gonna talk about the Swine Project, especially as it relates to um, ractopamine use and um, how to help guide you in, in making some good decisions with your project. So we'll cover that this evening. And um, I will talk just a bit more about what the next few nights are here in a second. So just making sure you guys know Zoom, I'm sure with all the virtual learning, you guys are experts at this, but I just want to remind you that um, please stay muted this evening. If you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat box um, that's provided below on your screen and um, go ahead and put the chat, uh, the question in the chat and I will monitor the questions for our speakers this evening. So feel free to ask um, what those uh, questions might be that your family have been thinking about, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get them covered. If we aren't able to cover them all, I will capture the questions, and we will um, get them answered and, and visit with you later uh, following the event, okay? So again, make sure you're muted, and I'll um, be muting people as, as they come in, okay? Uh, so the next question, or the next, uh, here's the, the slides on the remaining uh, presentations we have this uh, spring. Uh, March 11th, we will be in the new Meat Science building. building. Uh, so some of you were able to take in the tour we had, um, and, and we're actually going to put the building to use uh, next month. We're going to be cooking some lamb. We're gonna be um, mixing and making some meat culinary products um, with lamb. Uh, so if you are in the LAM project as well or want to know more about cookery, please join us next month, uh, March 11th. And you can register in the same place as you did for uh, this session this evening. Um, April, we will be talking about artificial intelligence or using um, science and technology like sensors in other ways that we use um, them in production of animals in, in their growth and composition. So please join us in April. And uh, if you're ready for the grill, like I will be by May and kick this uh, cold weather to the curb, um, we will be cooking uh, some brats and making uh, brats in the new meat science building too. So um, that's what we have left in store for the spring for our trainings. Uh, many of you this evening are looking for some educational um, credits or verifications for your county or local fairs. Um, here is the link to that education form. It was in your email that you received for this session this evening. And um, I will also put the link in the chat once I'm uh, passed this on to our speakers. So um, fill that out, write some things down of what you've learned from this uh, activity this evening and, and think of a couple of ways that you plan to use this information in your project. Uh, we'll plan on moving you can then share this uh, sheet with your, um, you know, your fair and livestock committees uh, for, for that verification for this summer, okay? And if you want uh, more information about what we offer in the Youth Livestock Program in Wisconsin, uh, there's all of the uh, sites and links you can go to. Uh, the recording of this evening uh, session will be on the YouTube channel, uh, the Wisconsin Youth Livestock YouTube channel. And um, there will, that's where all of the recordings for this spring will be housed, as well as there's a lot of other videos there that you would find um, extremely beneficial in terms of education. Uh, so check it out. Uh, if you missed the Roaming the Rumen activity last month, uh, you can hit it uh, by going to the YouTube channel, okay? 
And um, at the end this evening, we'd really want you to fill out this evaluation. Um, evaluations and feedback from you all really helps us um, be able to pinpoint what you're interested in and what other uh, topics and interests that you have that we can try and um, hit the next time we offer these types of webinars, okay? So um, I am going to just pass this on here or introduce our speakers and move into the session for this evening. I'm gonna stop sharing here um, and get us in a place where we can uh, make sure I can share it with, um, let's see, Dr. Moeller. Okay. So um, as we're joining again, please mute uh, yourself and we're gonna begin. Uh, so we're gonna start off with Dr. Steve Moeller. Uh, Dr. Moeller um, was or, or is uh, the, I'm just trying to rearrange my, there we go. Um, is this, is uh, with Ohio State University and at Ohio State, he has been there for a number of years as an instructor and researcher and um, really specifically in the areas of, um, you know, uh, growth and composition, meat quality, and teaches a lot of swine um, courses at The Ohio State University. So we always give each other, you know, the business, the Buckeyes and the other red versus uh, the, the Badger, Wisconsin Badger. So I don't know, we'll, we'll see who uh, wins here on, on a few of these games yet uh, for the season. But we appreciate Dr. Moeller coming on. Um, he has joined us before uh, with uh, this topic and we appreciate his willingness to come back and um, give us some more knowledge on, on uh, Ractopamine use. So I'll pass this on over to Dr. Moeller. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Bernie, and uh, thank you to everyone in attendance. I appreciate the opportunity to be here via Zoom. I'm sitting in my, my home office, which has been my home office now, it seems like, instead of my regular office for nearly a year. So we are probably a, a bit tired of Zoom, but one of the things I will tell you is it's pretty amazing how we can make contact around the world. Uh, around the world with people. So it's pretty cool to do that. And we're gonna talk about ractopamine. And I use that term up front to really describe uh, the, the compound itself, the product that makes our pig uh, change their composition, makes them grow faster, makes them more efficient. But we're facing an, an interesting uh, world today where the ability to use these products has been challenged by a, a few different uh, situations that have occurred. So I'm gonna take kind of an example of, of ractopamine and its use in the US. I wanna talk about the legal use guidance that we are all to follow as we think about our projects and commercial production, uh, what the packers are requiring today and why they're requiring that. I wanna talk a little bit about residue testing and some of the challenges and opportunities we see in that, in that realm. And, and really think about options of where you have uh, the market these show type animals. Um, I don't know if you guys recognize all you young people, but we, we will uh, harvest about 500,000 pigs a day in the US. 500,000 pigs go to market through our packing plants and then get distributed out to our consumers, including probably some of you that buy pork locally. And, and that, that what we call the pork chain from your farm all the way through to the consumer, whether that consumer is in the US or across the world is a very important part. And you guys are very important part in making sure that we have that market and that we have the ability to consumers needs wherever they are in the world. And they are a little different on where you are in the world. So I show this picture here of the, the producer with his pen of pigs. It's no different than you with your one, two, three, ten 10 pigs. Um, we are very happy to see youth like you participating in a project where your, your focus is learning about agriculture, learning about pigs in this case, or animals in general, and thinking about the meat we put in the meat case, because uh, there are a lot of people 
that uh, unfortunately around the world and still in the U.S. go hungry. I want you all think about the importance of producing high quality food for our consumers. So let's uh, let's switch gears here a little bit. Talk about the product itself. Uh, Dopamine is what we call a beta adrenergic agonist, and for many of you, that's a very foreign term. But basically, it's a it's a product, and when we feed it to our pigs, can improve growth rate. It can uh, make a pig heavier muscle, so we can increase muscle, and we can actually uh, catabolize or reduce fat, back fat on the pig. So it's going to make them appear more muscular make them appear uh, a bit more, if you want to say, showy, depending upon what your judges like. But today, the, the challenge we get into with this product, whether it's uh, a product from Zoetis called Endgain or a product from Elan called Paline, is that we use this product uh, based upon what our consumers want. And our consumers across the world are saying, unfortunately, for some, that you know, we don't want this paleen product, this ractopamine product, this end gain product in our pork. And if we find it, unfortunately, we will not be able to export pork. So basically, we have seen a switch over the last almost uh, a year and a half now, uh, at least one year from most packers, where they have said, Pork industry, uh, because the vast majority of, of our product can't be segregated into those who have been fed paline and those who haven't, or fed ractopamine, uh, we're going to go ractopamine free. And the group of packers that I list here, Smithfield, Tyson, J.B. Hormel, Indiana Packing, Clemens Food Group, uh, you can go on and on. Those are the Packers. They've said because of export markets that they're no longer going to accept market hogs fed ractopamine. And what that's changed for, for you as a 4-H'er is that many of you probably are marketing your pigs coming out of the fair. You're looking at those pigs and you're saying, uh, I need to send it to market. It's going to go to one of these packers potentially. And if you have just like any other producer, large or small, if you happen to be feeding paline or ractopamine or end game, you are in a situation where if a residue shows up, it may jeopardize the integrity of the product that's going into export and that packer may not have a market for their pork. So it's a real deal. And, and, and I can tell you this, we get into the cleanup a little bit later, uh, our feed mills across this country had a significant challenge in cleaning up after they put uh, ractopamine through their mill. And you may face some of that same challenge if you used the product in the past. Okay. So the product remains legal, so you can legally use it. It's when it gets into the packing plants that have put a ban that you have to be very concerned. Okay, so we all know that some of you I see online are, are buying your pig and Dr. DeRoshi is going to talk about, you know, feeding that pig and, and there's every combination of colors and, and shapes and sizes and it's kind of a fun little project. So as you think about that pig, some of the things I'll tell you is most of the time you can probably do as well without the need for paline or ractopamine or end gain as you do uh, with it. The reason that our industry went ractopamine free is because about $3 of every pig that's marketed in this country, those 500,000 a day, 140 million this year in 2021, about 27% of the value comes from export markets. So that means that 27% of really the overall 
money that you get in your pocket is due to sale of those pigs somewhere else in the world. And we have lots of different partners, China, Japan, Mexico, Canada, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Philippines, Africa, South Africa, lots of places that buy our product. And those are the that we can't lose. If we don't have that $53, uh, producers are losing money. If they lose money, they're not staying in business. And then we have some challenges. So interestingly, when you think of some of our foreign markets, some of our export markets, uh, maybe you've all heard the term everything but the oink. And we do sell every part of that pig but the, but the oink. And if you've had pig snouts, uh, probably won't find those in many places in the US, but you can find them in Mexico and in China and in Taiwan and they like it, they love it. Pig ears, if you've never eaten a pig ear, I would say cook one up sometime. They're a bit crunchy. I've eaten pig ears in China many times. Uh, probably not my favorite in the US, what are they? They're dog treats, right? But they still have value. Um, how many of you like heart? Ah, those internal organs. I, I'm, a, I'm a big beef heart person but I'm not so much pork heart. What about the, the liver? Some of your parents may really like liver. But some of your parents may really not. But we have an export group that really likes it. And that's where we will find our ractopamine in higher concentrations, because that's one of the filter organs in our body. And then we've got kidneys, and we've got the uterus and the bladder and the stomach, tails and the feet. And a lot of those go to the export market. And those, some of those organs, the internal organs, are where we'll see the highest concentrations of our ractopamine products. So I want to switch gears. I've kind of explained why we've gone ractopamine free. And one of the challenges that we find, and this is maybe more for the parents than you young people, but if any of you like chemistry, you need to learn a little bit about how we do testing. And this is what's called a lateral flow testing method. So we have a good test out there. And we can do a urine test on a pig to see if it's been exposed or had consumed ractopamine at some point. And we can also do a saliva test. And these are very qualitative tests, meaning we get a yes or no kind of answer. Has there been exposure? And when we do these tests, they're also very rapid. We can probably get a response in about 10 minutes. So kind of a cool test, but it does give you a few false positives. I mean, it may say, I detected ractopamine and it really wasn't there. Okay, so it's very sensitive, but it's a great opportunity for you guys to think about. To give you a little bit of background, it's about $8 per sample, okay? Uh, and we have county fairs that have gone to doing this on- Wait, what? Or on uh, some of the pigs randomly throughout. So it's pretty cool that you can do it. And Neogen does that test. There's also a test for feed sampling. And if- Wait, 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 what happened? If you've used uh, ractopamine in the past on your farm, what happened to the you may have, you know, feed dust that may still contain particles. In those Hi, particles, Teddy. we may need to actually do some testing. So you could actually test your environment to find out whether you have some contamination. So those tests are also available through a company called Neogen. I'm straight up. Now, when you find, and we've had this same thing in our in our state here in Ohio, where we have found samples that come back from that first test positive, we've always had to verify it with a, what we call an ELISA, ELISA test. Very definitive, very accurate, and it tells you a true yes or no, okay? And oftentimes, I remember I said something about using uh, tissue, oftentimes, Put a kidney in there. You could do a urine sample, 
but uh, the, oftentimes it'll be the carcass. We'll take out the kidney and we'll send it for analysis. It's pretty expensive. My understanding is about $300 a test, uh, depending upon where you send it. But I'm giving this information to some of you as parents because you'll have some concerns about whether, you know, your pig, which is free of ractopamine, might be exposed to some other pig that may be fed that. Okay, so those are things to kind of put in the back of your mind. Now, here's probably where the message means the most to me. All of you who are out there buying your pigs now, you're going to put them into uh, the pen. You're going to be ready for them. And hopefully, we're all following some of those things we learn in quality assurance, meaning we've cleaned out our pens, we've prepared that pen with, you know, good or good air quality and good heating and cooling when we need it. Of course, it's not too hard to get cold now, but might need a little heat right now. So I want you to think about where you should clean at home. Your, your home housing should be cleaned very thoroughly. Clean up any dust. Remember that feeder you used last year? It's going to have a little bottom on it. It's going to have some saliva and other things that make it make that feed stick. So it's best if you go through with some soap and a high pressure washer if you have it and you do a very thorough cleaning, okay? Take any opportunity for any res residual, anything that's left over to uh, make certain it doesn't get into that pig's, the new pig's uh, environment so that they consume it. And don't forget about your trailers. Your trailers need to be clean. They need to be washed out from top to bottom and uh, a good cleaning will always help you, not only from being ractopamine-free, but also keeping your pig healthy. To have very good body measures in place. So don't forget your vehicles and all of your equipment, your tack boxes, all those things that you take from one place to another. Uh, get them out, spend a little time cleaning. It's a good Saturday project. Uh, something you can do on your own. When it comes to... Uh, your fair. We have people who are very concerned that they take a pig to the fair and it's exposed to someone else's pig. And uh, as you as you young people think about that, it is your responsibility to feed your pig, water your pig, and make sure that you're keeping it in a good environment. So fresh shavings, starting with a clean pen to know that you don't have any contamination. As you walk that pig down the, the alley here, as we show in the middle, make sure that it doesn't get into someone else's feed. Uh, pigs are, they'll eat anything. And many times we actually are managing these pigs with uh, kind of limited feed toward the end. So they could be a little hungry. Be careful of whose uh, feed can they put their nose in. And as you get out into the show ring, it's, it's very hopeful that between groups of pigs from year to year that you've cleaned that show ring completely. You've washed it down as well to make sure that there isn't any residual in, the, uh, in that mulch or in that sawdust uh, so that you don't spread from one animal to another or even one species to another. Those are things that are important. And when we think about what we should do when we clean. We start with a good, I guess you'd say brush down. Get all the big stuff, all that manure, any of those contaminants out of the way. And there's a product here called Barnstormer that while it's very, very good in commercial application, it will clean. It's a very, very strong uh, cleaner. You have to use uh, very good protective equipment, but it's one of the best cleaners you can have. And we show this young person here doing a foamer and they're applying disinfectant. So they're actually doing another job of, of, of killing off microorganisms, disease causing viruses and bacteria. And then ultimately we dry so that when the pigs are come in, they have a nice dry environment to start out their time on your farm. So those are things we want you to think about. Always remember that while ractopamine is legally usable in the industry, the beef industry, and in turkeys. There are times when we got to be very considerate 
that if we expose our pig to a calf that's had uh, ractopamine fed to it and it eats the manure, you could have a pig that will test positive. So we aggregate those species. <laughs> and the goal should be awareness. We should be aware that there is a industry in concern and there's an industry approach to maintaining those export markets. That's why our packers have said we will no longer take pigs from anyone who has uh, fed or used ractopamine in swine feed. Always get a little bit concerned about transportation when we start thinking about semi loads of hogs or large trailers full of pigs, particularly if it happens to be that they have cattle that have been in that trailer before. Um, cattle trailers aren't cleaned nearly as thoroughly between groups as pig trailers. And when we have manure and cattle that potentially could have consumed ractopamine, those pigs may eat it on the way to the slaughterhouse, to the packing plant. So we gotta be careful. I would make sure that when you load up large groups of pigs at your county fair, that you make certain that uh, you are having clean trailers uh, to put into play, okay? And then your take home message is just remember this, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we wanna make sure that we have a safe and a wholesome product for our consumer, regardless if they're just in the US or around the world, okay? If the consumers don't wanna buy our product. Stop drawing on the screen. Okay. So if your fair happens to be one that chooses ractopamine free or to send your pigs home, um, remember this also, if, if you fed ractopamine and you took your pig home and then tried to market it outside of a fair, you still have the same responsibility if it's going to those major packers because it will test positive for a significant amount of time. Uh, when you find that market, uh, if it's a local market, you can be well assured that there is no safety issue with the pork. So a lot of our small packers will take these pigs and that's a good thing. Uh, it's an alternate market to the large packers, but it's sure a very important market for the 4-H type pig. So that was my last slide. Uh, Bernie, I'll turn it back to you and we'll go over to Joel. And we'll take it at the end, I believe. For Dr. Moeller. Uh, for, for getting us off first base. And then we'll uh, certainly uh, move over to uh, Dr. Darushi. Um, so Dr. Darushi, he is coming from us from K-State. Uh, he is originally from South Dakota, uh, he, around the Mitchell um, Pakwana area, right? If I remember that correctly. Um, and so he uh, is a swine nutritionist there. And uh, we really appreciate him being with us. Um, he's been at uh, K-State for a number of years and then um, is, uh, does a lot of research in swine nutrition, um, probably from all aspects, um, from, from nursery pigs to finishing pigs and, and a lot in between. So we're really glad that uh, Dr. Darushi could be with us tonight to talk a little bit about uh, nutrition and feeding and really selection around uh, picking out those pigs that can really do well in the show ring and for you as a as a feeder. So uh, I'm passing it to you, uh, Joel. Thanks so much for joining us from Manhattan, Kansas. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be uh, with everybody tonight. And, and this is a time of year that, uh, um, yeah, a lot of these junior events are occurring. Actually, this morning, I just helped uh, Ohio State uh, do a nutrition one. And actually, next week here at Kansas State, uh, we're hosting our junior swine uh, program virtually. Uh, and so it's great to have everybody um, with us and, and to be part of the event here tonight. So a couple of things I'd like to go through. And again, I, as Bernie helped set it up well in terms of talking about the nutrition. Uh, there's questions on if you've used ractopamine in the past, what do I do now? And, and honestly, I think that there's a lot of real simple things that, that can be done in terms of uh, just uh, not having to rely on that type of feed additive if you think you need, in the past have needed that to make your pigs um, the best they can be. So really what I wanna get to tonight is really again, uh, Dr. Muller already talked about what ractopamine is, but I just wanna hit a couple points that set up on the selection and nutrition side for you. I also wanna talk then about the, the selection. 
And so again, I think as we think about uh, paling and or whether we have it or not, uh, a good pig still a good pig. Uh, our selection really shouldn't change that much. We may have to do a little bit different. And I'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. I want to talk about when we uh, diet crude protein. When we, when if we, if there's one thing that we can do in the absence of paling, again uh, to put on more muscle at the end, crude protein is one. And I think this has to do with all your pigs. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time on it. And then as well as mixing uh, feed, if you do that at your own place, uh, just proper ways to do that with your different additives or the feed itself. So what is ractopamine? Uh, again, it, it, Dr. Muller already set it up. It's a, it, it helps redirect. So basically uh, what it's doing is it's taking nutrients that that pig consumes, helps it stay leaner and get more total muscle. That's really the bottom line. And it's approved. There's lots of different show feeds, companies that have sold paline in the past of different names. But again, we're moving on from that. And that's kind of why we're having this discussion here tonight. So in the end of the day, what did paline do for you? If you actually chose to feed this feed additive, generally after about 21 days of feeding it in the feed, your pig would weigh somewhere between six and 10 pounds more versus if it didn't. So it helped them grow faster. The other thing that it would probably do is had, add more muscle shape. Generally on show pigs in particular, if you want to actually see a muscle shape difference, um, it really needs to be fed for a minimum of seven days and often takes longer, um, up to 14 or even 21 days to actually see that muscle actually get more shape and mass. And so again, from a show pig um, perspective, that's often what would have to happen to accomplish that. So what are the negatives? So again, if, if you've been using it um, and you've used it for extra weight gain, um, you know, the problem is, is that the pig's going to gain more if you're at market weight. So let's say your county fair is, is uh, 10 days away. Your pig already weighs 285 pounds and you decide, boy, I need to put him on paline. Well, now your pig is going to well, weigh well over 300, probably closer to 310. So again, just because of that add weight gain, it certainly can be a negative if your pig is already big, close to your fare, then you chose to use it there at the end. If you fed it and your pig had plenty of muscle, but you were worried about going to the fair and somebody else is going to have more muscle than me. So you feed it and you try and get more muscle shape. Well, in fact, you might have gotten more muscle, but the feet and legs on this third point probably came with it that it was hindered. The pig uh, walks poor, um, it's stiffer, and just simply doesn't flow as well out in the ring. And, and quite honestly, that's been the largest issue in the show pig side. And this is in the commercial industry too. As you put weight and mass of muscle on that pig in a, in a shorter period of time, they simply just don't walk as free and easy. And so again, that's probably been the biggest consequence. And, and honestly, for many of you that if you've, if you've used it, I can assure you that you've had pigs not walk as well and you probably got placed lower in class because of it. It's happened to me, my family, and I didn't talk about at the beginning, I have a slide here at the end. Each year, my family, we have about 25 to 30 show pigs. Um, we're heavily involved in the 4-H uh, youth program side. Um, I grew up with a lot of pigs in South Dakota. Um, and again, one of the things we do in the 4-H and youth side is show a lot of pigs. And I can assure you, when, I, when, we've, when we've used paling in the past, um, we've, cause pigs not to do as well because we actually used it. And this would be a great example. The feet and legs just don't hold up. So what do we do without it? Honestly, it, it, it really shouldn't change a lot. But if you used it as example, so a scenario, if you used it to have your pigs gain extra weight prior to the show. So if you are routinely too light getting to your show, and I'll just use a county fair as the example, what you're going to have to do is simply purchase an older pig. You know, if you think about a paling gave an extra six to 10 pounds of, of weight gain and a pig gains roughly, you know, most show pigs now gain a pound and a half to 1.8 pounds per day. You know, you're going to need a pig that's simply just a week older and it'll still be as big at your county fair. The other thing that I think is really interesting. And, and so for I know we have a lot of young uh, um, uh, participants tonight and in, in the youth. Think about this. This is my first time being here. If you were to go into a litter of pigs and these pigs weigh 50 to 60 pounds when you go to pick. If there's a pig that weighs about 70 pounds, and then there's another pig that weighs in the same litter about 60 pounds, it's about 10 pounds less already. 
by the time they get to market weight, that 70 pound pig will probably be about 30 pounds heavier than, the, than its litter mate that was 10 pounds lighter when they were 50 to 60 pound pigs. So this is something you have to consider if you use it for extra weight gain, make sure you're not buying one of the smallest pigs in the litter of that ideal age because you may not be big enough at that time. If you use it to prevent fat cover, um, you know, again, you're gonna have to feed a lower fat diet because pigs are what they eat. And so if you're feeding a high fat diet, the pigs are gonna get a little fatter. Now you don't have paling to keep them lean at the end. You're simply gonna have to use a lower fat diet. And the last thing is if you use it for more muscle shape, which was the primary reason most did it, you're simply gonna have to make, adjust your selection just slightly. And again, this is one you do not want to go overboard and say, all right, I need to pick a heavier muscle pig because paleen, I used to get more muscle shape in the end. Um, so you may have to adjust your selection or probably the one of the things is feeding a higher protein diet for the last month prior to the show. So when I want to talk about selection and have, just have a few minutes here, I want to spend on it. And so again, nothing should change dramatically in terms of the type of pig that you're going to purchase. Uh, a good pig is still a good pig. If whatever breed, whatever, if you like a gilt or a barrel, none of that should change. Um, ractopamine had nothing to do with a high quality young pig that you would select. So the only difference I would caution, if you generally have a habit to select a less muscular pig and you relied on paleen, um, in fact, then to, I'm gonna heat this, uh, less muscular pig, to actually get extra muscle before your fair, you're probably gonna have to shift to having a little bit heavier muscle pig at purchase because now you don't have necessarily the means to do that. And I would say too, I know I'm gonna get into it on the feed side. The reality is there's very little with a feed bucket that you can get to increase the muscle mass in, in muscle of what paleen did. There just isn't things out there that do it in the same fashion. So I'd like to get into some pictures now. So again, what I would like to do on this is just show some pictures of some pigs um, that have never been fed paling. And again, this would be typical of most pigs. I would still say of, of most people watching tonight, I would say probably at least over half of you have never fed ractopamine, which is not uncommon. Um, here would be a gilt that was purchased um, for a county fair show. Again, if you look at this particular gilt and again on selection, again, one that you like from the muscle shape in its top. So this gilt has a nice groove down her top. So that's gonna show she's gonna have muscle her whole life. If you look in her ham, a lot of shape. And some people may think she actually has too much shape at this given weight. And I wouldn't argue with that. Um, and as when you see when she gets big, she has a, still a big shapely ham. But if you look at her hind legs, see how she has a nice curvature in that hock area where it's not a straight leg up and down. It's a nice curve. So that's an indication that she should be sound on her feet and legs. And in fact, this gilt uh, grew well, had a lot of muscle, uh, just fed normal diets and turned out really well winning a county fair. Here's another pig that was purchased. Again, the, where I'm trying to go on some of these where you wanna have enough muscle, if you look at this shape at top, this pig has a nice groove down its top, okay? Now, if you come to the ham, again, it's really wide over its rump, a lot of shape through its ham. And again, some people may think, wow, there's a lot of muscle. And, and you're right, there is for this young a pig, it was probably on the edge, you know, in terms of having almost too much muscle too early. But again, put on a normal diet, one that's not high protein, just a normal nutrition program, this pig fed and end up winning uh, the Kansas State Fair uh, a few years ago. And this is one just from last year. This was a pig that was purchased um, um, in the spring. Again, a pig that has a lot of muscle. If you look at that groove right down its top, that's an indication it's gonna have a lot of natural shape of muscle really the rest of its life. A pig that's good on its feet and legs, uh, real level and balanced. And again, has uh, a little bit less muscle shape than the last two pigs, okay? And as this pig turned out the state fair, again, this pig was uh, ended up winning the state fair, had a lot of muscle in his top, Probably doesn't have as much muscle shape in his ham compared to the last two, uh, but he didn't need, he had more than adequate. And again, these are pigs that never had to been fed ractopamine and did awful well um, in our state. Now, the other side is if we look at this blue barrel, uh, blue top barrel, you say, wow, this guy from Kansas State said we got to get more muscle in our pigs. Uh, this would be an example of going too extreme and what not to do. 
Now, this pig has a huge groove down his top, but if you look how big his shoulder is, and then look how big his ham is. And again, this pig's only about 40 pounds. This is a pig, in my opinion, that has way too much muscle early on. And in fact, if you look at its hind leg, look how straight that hind leg is. And, in, and this pig just simply may not have the flexibility with all the muscle it has just to hold together and, and be a quality pig in the end. And in fact, this pig, you know, generally has a bad ending. Um, and it did. I, I know uh, from personal experience, um, this pig uh, never got shown and he just went to the locker. A uh, pig that never should have been bought, um, that my family did. And in fact, uh, just had way too much to him. And that's an extreme of trying to go too far in one area and simply became a pig that became very unsound on his feet and legs and didn't grow. So selection take homes. Nothing should change dramatically when you pick your pigs out this spring. Good pigs are still good pigs. I would say this, since there's so many online sales going on right now, I would say, and I'm very passionate about this. We buy quite a few pigs online. We buy a lot privately. We buy in some, in some public sales. Never ever buy a pig online without talking to the breeder first. I know I'm good friends with lots of breeders and they would estimate that over half their pigs sell without, some, without who's ever purchasing, ever calling and asking and talking to them about it. And I can say that's probably one of the biggest ways you can get disappointed because a pitcher is only a pitcher. Call the breeder, visit with them about your goals. And again, if, if it's a new breeder, if it's an existing breeder, it's the same conversation. And again, do never buy a pig online without visiting with the breeder and get their recommendations because they may have some other suggestions of actually what fits your needs a little bit better. Also, after you purchase a pig, I talk to, breed, I talk to every breeder we get a pig from two, three, four times during the year to talk about how it's going, get their suggestions as well. They know their genetics. One of the biggest mistakes every one of you online could make is that you buy a pig from a breeder and then you never talk to them. You show them at county fair or jackpots or your state fair. And then when you're done, you may or may not even let them know how that pig does. The breeders care deeply how the pigs do. They care about you because you purchased and, and they want to build loyalty and help. Please use that as a means. We talk about what are we going to do without paling? Visit with the breeders. Let them help you get information how to best care and feed your particular pig. So now I just want to talk about diet crude protein, and I, I don't want this to get too complicated, but the way to think about protein is really what it is. It helps make up all the muscle in your body. So every one of you online, um, I have three children, uh, a junior, a sophomore, and a seventh grader, and James, my oldest, he's, he's active in sports. Uh, they all are, and so they lift weights. The only way they're going to get more muscle mass is by lifting but also eating the right diet with enough protein. And really protein is amino acids that help build the muscle in our bodies. And basically what we can do is we can change the amount of these protein or amino acids to help influence how much muscle your particular pig will actually develop over the course of its growing period. And so what I wanna try and do is give some general guidelines. So again, for a lot of the parents, um, you would understand this and for some of the, the beginners, this may seem like, uh, may seem like, boy, this is complicated, but it's really not. Think about the amount of protein in the diet. So if I had a 50 pound bag of feed, what this means is that 20% of this is actually made up of amino acids or protein if the diet's 20%. And generally that's good for pigs that are 25 to 50 pounds in weight. And then they have lysine levels of 1.3 to 1.4. Lysine is an amino acid. It's what we formulate to in swine diets. 18%. So if you go down, now it's a little bit bigger pig, 50 to 150, and then the corresponding lysine level. 16% crude protein, so there's less. So as pigs get older, they actually require less amino acids and less protein on a daily basis in their ration for optimal growth and muscle development. Okay, so these are general guidelines of how many pigs are, are fed uh, not only in commercial, but also in show feeds and for your show animals as well. So if we look at, I want to take you through some different scenarios. So again, this would be examples. Think about pigs you had last year even, or pigs that you may want to buy this year. And again, if you think about if you want regular weight gain, so the pigs just on a normal weight gain to your county fair, 
And with structure and muscle, that's ideal. So you have a nice pig that you don't think you have to try and change with nutrition. You just select that feed that meets the lysine or that crude protein need. You put them on that and you just kind of go for the different weight ranges all the way up to your market weight when you get to your show. Now, however, that's not always possible sometimes. Sometimes if you think back to that blue barrel that I point out, if you see too heavy muscle, or if you have a pig that is uh, very tight structured, so they're tight on their feet and legs, they're not very good structured, they're kind of uh, very stiff moving. What do you do in that case? Well, here's where you actually take, instead of feeding a 16% diet, um, you maybe feed a 14. Or in the case, if you have a younger pig that should be quote unquote on an 18%, go ahead and put them on a 16 or a lower amino acid level. Basically what that does, it doesn't allow them to maximize, to put on more muscle. They kind of hold it together, but then they grow up into it. So they don't have all that extra muscle and it improves their appearance. And then they can help walk better when you actually take some of the muscle out of them, okay? Now, a case like for ractopamine, if you have a pig that you used to use this on, that was a little narrower made, a little lighter muscle and just didn't have enough top or enough ham shape behind, this is when many of you maybe would have used ractopamine to help build that muscle mass up. Or if they're getting too fat, again, paleine would have helped keep them a little bit leaner uh, to your market weight. So now is actually when you do the opposite on proteins, when you feed higher protein. So in that previous slide, I said a finishing pig may need around a 16% lysine or 16% crude protein diet. Well, now in the end, that last month, you may move them back to an 18 or even a 20% crude protein to help them maximize how much muscle they have, as well as keep them leaner. So again, just changing those diets can help influence the amount of muscle shape that that pig has. And that's relevant to our paleo discussion of how some of you may have used that in the past. So again, how do you change crude protein? So you already bought your diet and I say, boy, I need to change the protein. I need to have more. Well, many show feed companies sell these type of products uh, that you can purchase and top dress to put protein on. Another way is simply um, buying soybean meal. Soybean meal is a, 40, is a high protein ingredient. Soybean meal is already in all your swine diet. So every swine diet you feed, I can guarantee you soybean meal is already in it contributing a lot of protein and amino acids. So again, one way you can do this yourself, if you have, I'm using an example here of a 20 pound pail of complete feed. So if you take a five gallon pail, fill it almost full of feed, it's gonna weigh about 20 pounds. You can simply add in a half a pound of soybean meal and you take your 16% protein, now it's 17%. So you can increase the protein by simply buying soybean meal at your co-op or feed store. Um, or again, there's a lot of show companies sell a lot of supplements. Uh, those can be used per their directions as well. Soybean meal is relatively inexpensive at 12 to $15 a bag. And you can do and, and use that as a cheap protein source that really does well. And I'll be honest, that's all my family use. That's all we use to change the protein in an increase if we have to do that over a base diet for a particular pig. One of the best ways that we mix feed, again, we have quite a few 4-H pigs. And so if we just had a two or three, we would not do this. And when we first started, that's what we did when each kid, one of my kids had one or two pigs. Uh, we just mix it in a five gallon bucket if we were gonna mix. We actually use a cement mixer. And so we can mix 50 pounds at a time or a pail at a time. If we wanna put more soybean meal in. If we have some, we need more fat or more fiber. This works really, really well. And again, you can use this for cattle, all your species and really help simplify the mixing process because we just want to mix feed once or twice a week. We do not want to do that every day. And so this allows us to do it once or twice a week for our pigs. So with that, I want to conclude and just thank you for being part of uh, the Junior Swine Project. Again, my family, I grew up with a lot of pigs. Uh, it's something I'm very passionate about. I'm very fortunate, like Steve, uh, Dr. Moeller at, at Ohio State to have a career in the swine industry. Um, I would say, there's lots of opportunities. If you love pigs and wanna be involved in the industry, there is oodles of jobs at all levels, whether it's working with pigs every day, whether it's being a geneticist, of course, the veterinary side, uh, nutritionist, um, the, the food, um, the meat science, lots of opportunities. And so I would encourage you to think if you love swine and want a career, there's lots of opportunities and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. And so again, these picture of my family, um, and again, uh, tonight, 
my two boys are playing basketball, my daughter's in cheerleading, and I'm here with you, and I'd rather be, this is a great place, this is something I'm really passionate about, and just like to thank you for being part of things tonight. So with that, Bernie, uh, that concludes my information, and I'll um, stop sharing and bring it back to the, the full group. Great. Well, thanks again, um, uh, Joel, and, and well, Dr. Darushi and, and Dr. Moeller. Um, if you can come back on, uh, Dr. Moeller, perfect. We've got you there. Um, if you could just, um, there's a couple of questions, and I know both of you could maybe uh, address it, but there was a question related to lysine, uh, Joel. If you could just explain a little bit about lysine and you know why it's important in a swine diet, maybe as compared to maybe other uh, domestic animals or animals that they might be interested in. Yeah, that was a good. I wanted. I didn't want to get too deep with uh, with everybody tonight, but yeah. So in 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 when we buy show feeds, it's generally on a crude protein basis. But honestly, pigs have no requirement for crude protein. What we have requirements for is uh, amino acids. So humans are the same way. We need amino acids to build the muscles in your body. So all you kids out there, grab your arms, right? So big muscles on your arms. Okay, your arms, all the muscle that we have is made up of amino acids and amino acids are, so if you think about uh, putting a puzzle together or building a, a, a tall uh, uh, building with Legos, all those Legos, crude protein, all those Legos act as amino acids that form muscle, okay? And so lysine is one of the, is the most important amino acid, what we call it, it's limiting or we don't have enough oftentimes in a corn and soybean diet that we'd all feed. So we have to formulate to make sure we bring in enough of that to meet the needs of the pig to grow. So it's an amino acid. We use the word crude protein. Crude protein, crude protein is made up of amino acids and other amino acid names such as methionine, threonine, um, valine, other ones. And they all work together to form muscle and have the body function properly. So lysine in pigs, is the most important amino acid that we formulate for in the nutrition of pigs and then make sure all the rest are balanced uh, to have the right amounts to make the proper amount of muscle both in pigs in chickens this would be in any any animal humans as well great thank you um there was another question more on like exercising so you've talked a lot about muscle and muscle development and obviously as you shared right lifting weights kind of stretches those muscles, rips those muscles and rebuild, right? So um, I think if we do enough muscle biology or, or mm -hmm. we talk enough about that, that's some Is this science that's background comes out with, um, we can certainly uh, put some exercise in them and kind of help with that muscle development. Can you just speak to that maybe just a bit? There's been a few questions about that. Yeah, really, really good. And yeah, exercising or, or any of our livestock or any of our can dairy this, animals is very important. And pigs are, pigs are um, you know, it's very common that a lot of people would exercise their pigs. You know, you just take them, you need to get them out of the pen, take them out in the yard, don't let them eat your mom's flowers. Uh, personal experience there doesn't go over very well. Uh, but just ex get them out in the yard and practice showing. So it'd be very typical for us. Um, all of our pigs uh, would be exercised somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes a day uh, when we get into the summer, especially leading up to shows. It's real important that they get out because it calms them down. Uh, if nothing else, uh, it, it helps that animal build uh, lung function, just like any athlete. And so when you go in the show ring, and oftentimes if you see pigs just panting and hot, I mean, if it's hot, it's hot. Pigs are going to get that way. But oftentimes they just didn't have enough athletic ability to walk that long a period of time and muscle in, in exercising does it helps build some muscle tone and it helps keep the pigs leaner so pigs that just stay in their pan and all they do is eat all day long uh, they're going to get fatter than those that are out exercising and so exercising is a very important aspect of any any project whether that's lambs goats or cattle all animals, all of our animals need enough exercise and pigs are, it's particularly important for them as well that we do that. And it helps prepare you for showmanship. It just makes your pig a lot more manageable to drive and it makes them look better by practicing, uh, getting them out and driving them out of the pen. Excellent, thanks, Joel. Um, I'm gonna pass this next question over to uh, Dr. Moeller. Uh, there was a question, Dr. Moeller, kind of back on the Asian markets a bit and just why 
um, you know, if paline's fine and approved to be fed, right, uh, why would we not uh, be talking about use of ractopamine? So could you address that just so just a quick again, I know you you covered it nicely in one of the slides, but I there uh, has been a few just extra questions along that space um, as it relates to, you know, the African swine fever and just what's kind of currently happening on the disease side of things. Sure, I, I think, you know, from the standpoint of, of ractopamine specifically, I just had a question here kind of in a personal too in the chat and I was responding to that and I'll respond to everybody. Basically it's an FDA approved drug if you use that term, it's an FDA approved additive and it has been proven safe and it has been to, you know, actually leave the, the, the majority of, you'd say the body's tissue in a very, very short period of time. So there is no withdrawal. The half-life is very, very short. Where we see it accumulating um, with the sensitivity of the test we have, we can find it in muscle and, uh, we can find it in those organs that are filters of the body. I'll use that term. Part of what we're seeing from our foreign markets is clearly a difference in their interpretation of um, what I'll call our FDA or their official health organizations. There's debate probably around the world about the safety of and, and including in Europe, where it's not used, legal. I, I believe in our FDA, I believe in, in their testing processes and, and uh, confident in the food that we eat is safe. But there's also a political side of that, and, and I can't ignore that part, and I won't tell you there's any different, but we're a competitive world, and um, if we don't supply pork into, let's say China as one example. Right now they're buying pork at tremendous levels because they've had the challenge with African swine fever. As they buy that product, uh, there's other groups competing for that market. Europe uh, and is one big one. And we know we're efficient producers in the US. Our cost is often less, so our pork is often less expensive, but there are often political battles that are fought over trade, not just trade in meat, but trade in other products, TV, you know, transistors, uh, microchips, you name it. And we get caught in that. And sometimes these are trade barriers. There's no doubt in my mind that some of this is a trade barrier attempt. So it may go away. Uh, I know we have a lot of lobbyists who try to help us in that position. But currently, if a packer is found to have ractopamine and a shipment of pork, they will likely not pay for the entire shipment and that packer will probably never sell at, for at least a very long time anyway, never get back into that market. And that's the challenge I see, if that helps. Joel, you might, uh, you might comment as well. I mean, there's, there's good evidence of the, of the value of ractopamine to improve efficiency of production when fed at two and a half to four grams a ton. Yeah, there, there's no, you're, you set that up well, Steve. And, and for everybody listening, I mean, this is one of the, the, the things that um, for, for relative use, um, we had estimates that about uh, over 80% of the pigs in the U.S. used to be fed ractopamine prior to market. That was because producers made an extra two to three dollars for every pig they sold. And that may not seem a lot, but you remember Dr. Miller said 500,000 pigs a day go to slaughter or go to our processing facilities. So you start doing the math on the large numbers. This was why, and it, it is, it's a trade issue. It's not a meat safety or a, a food quality issue. There's been lots of research done with it. Uh, you cannot, you would not be able to tell this pork chop is from a pig fed paline or not. Um, nor is there residue levels that um, would be affect you. Again, these are trade things. They're more philosophical as, as, as Dr. Muller's talked about, but it's real. It's real economics for our, for our industry. And so the packers have had to make the change. Now, if you um, sell your own locker meat, right? So again, it'll depend on your, your show rules and all the different things. I know some states have went to non-terminal. There's a lot of things that have happened. 
uh, because of the lack of availability to get some of your pigs in uh, that maybe go to larger plants. So you have to follow the rules. Otherwise, you're gonna we'll lose our markets for all of our youth livestock um, if we don't abide by these. And that's just you know it's not a meat safety issue; it's a trade issue. Yeah, that's exactly exactly it. And I think um, that will be the last question of the night. Um, I I really appreciate it, Joel, that you can jump on. Um, you know, I, missing missing boys' is, uh, games are no fun. So I'm glad you hung out with the Wisconsin crew tonight. Um, yeah. And I'm glad they're playing some ball. That's that's good to hear. So, um, yeah. and Dr. Moeller, I appreciate you always joining us, you know, us in the Eastern side of the Midwest, I guess. Um, yep. And, uh, and uh, so we appreciate you being on and helping us through this. Um, we will, uh, children and, and parents out there, uh, if you can fill out the evaluation form, that's over in the chat. Please click on that link and share with us some feedback from tonight and then also other topics you might be interested in. Um, we can try and, and cover that. Um, there are some questions. I will have a, a copy of the chat. So if you didn't get your question answered, I will certainly uh, jump in and try and uh, get those answered for you all. Um, I, I think the other last thing we just want to make you aware of as, as uh, Joel um, really shared is that you really need to kind of pay attention to what's going on with your fair, um, what kind of uh, decision making they might be having around uh, rectal mean and if that's allowed um, at your county fair. So um, just kind of watch newsletters, watch information and correspondence that comes from your local county fair and then also any other exhibition that you might be um, going to, such as state fair, regional shows, that sort of thing. Um, with the overstock, right, of local processors trying their best to, to work through uh, animals, uh, there may or may not be some of those opportunities for your fairs like they traditionally have been. So I know fairs are trying to adapt as best they can and trying to, to work with plants locally, but also, um, you know, there might be some opportunities in uh, bringing animals home. So we'll see how that shakes out for you all. This year is gonna be really interesting as, as last year was interesting too, but um, hopefully we're heading in the right direction. But just uh, the, of any year possible, this is the year you really gotta pay attention to what's coming from your fairs that you might be uh, exhibiting in, okay? And um, all of the recordings will be online. You'll get a, an email following tonight with some uh, information related to the evaluation and all of um, you know other ways to, to get the registrations for the next uh, upcoming um, presentations. So um, I think that's it, everyone. I'm trying to get you out of here in no more than an hour. I'm a little four minutes shy, but um, it's good to see. Again, all of you on this evening, we had like 420 people on here. So it was a lot to manage by myself, but I think we got her licked. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Moeller and again, Dr. Darushi for being on tonight. And you're getting a lot of thank yous through the chat. I'll send, send you those. And I don't know if you can see them at this point or not, but um, thanks again, everyone. And um, we'll end this evening. Have a good rest of your week and weekend. Stay warm. Thank you all.